Um, good afternoon to all, uh, good spring uh, to, all, to you all. Thank you for joining us in this uh, seminar, seminar which is uh, part of uh, both the theories of uh, regulation seminar and also the uh, seminar in, in the context of Ma'avarim, Academia IL, which deals with academic uh, citizenship. So thank you very much, uh, Gilberto, for joining us. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, let me introduce you to the audience. Most of, of them know you, but uh, maybe the people who will watch the YouTube uh, presentation won't, so, or do not know you. Um, I will say that Gilberto is professor of public policy at the University of Bologna, Italy. He was the director of the Italian Center of Research on Universities and Higher Education System between 2015 and 2021. Editor is the editor of uh, Policy and Society, specialized in public administration, public policy analysis, comparative higher education. He's one of the leading uh, researchers in public policy in Europe. And um, his research focuses on governance dynamics and performance of higher education in, uh, and education policy design, policy change, policy instrument, instrument impact the social role of political science, the policy impact of COVID-19, and leadership as embedded function of policy making. He published many books uh, that can be found uh, online, and uh, uh, he kindly agreed to present his work today here, um, and I'm very happy and very grateful for that. So, Gilberto, please, please go in. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. There, there. Yeah, yeah. May I start? Okay. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with this uh, group of uh, colleagues. Uh, I agreed with, uh, sorry, I started to make confusion as usual here. I agreed with uh, uh, David uh, that exactly because we, we are a few group in presence online, it would be great to have uh, not a formal uh, a speech but a kind of conversation so i have a powerpoint pre presentation with a few points that i wanna uh, i wanna uh, present for your consideration I, if you like you can interrupt me you can jump in you can uh, ask questions so uh, just to make it, it more comfortable exactly because i think that we are all bored of this online uh, stuff so i really count on you to make this uh, uh, interactive I have, a, I should have a presentation to share. I hope you can see it. Huh? Yes, we can. Perfect. So, and I have to, okay. So uh, what I'm going to present uh, is, I, I'm going to present a few ideas I have been developing uh, during the last year, so probably last 20 years uh, in which I have uh, been working a bit on uh, higher education governance changes. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, I present some uh, basic concepts of the field because uh, I have assumed that uh, the, uh, the attenders could be not uh, uh, professionally expert of uh, the field of uh, higher education governance. And then I will present some uh, uh, few points on uh, uh, what uh, has been the development uh, of uh, changes in governance in higher education. And I will present also a few data, whether this is the outline. The first point is a, a, a short definition of what is the governance mantra in reforming higher education. Then I will start focusing on the problem of governing university and the so-called traditional types of governance. I will say something on the ideational side of these reforms, on the instrumental sides and on the results of these reforms so that are hybridity mixes and national traditions. Uh, let's start about, uh, on what I define the governance mantra in reforming reform higher education. Personally, I think that in the last, in the last three decades, we have had uh, a governance mantra, a general governance mantra. mantra uh, governance is one of uh, uh, the most uh, used uh, concept in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, like uh, new public management and so on. So uh, as uh, I think we had uh, this mantra in every other policy field, we had also in uh, 
reforming higher education. So first of all, uh, allow me to briefly define that uh, what is the topic uh, of this presentation. It is a systemic governance in higher education, so no institutional governance, uh, systemic governance that uh, we can uh, generally define as the way through which higher education policy are coordinated uh, through institutionalized arrangement and practices. We have seen uh, that in the last four decades, uh, what uh, has been, have been considered the inherited characteristics of a higher education system have been significantly changed due to governmental reforms. So we had in the last 40 years, everywhere in the world, I would say, uh, continuous governmental reforms of, of systemic governance in higher education. These have been planned reform. Very often, some results have been unplanned or unexpected. However, it's quite clear that uh, this reform happened, uh, have been designed uh, and been, have been pursued under the pressure of big uh, social economic processes. So we know these processes, massification, welfare state financial crisis, globalization, internationalization, whatever uh, you like, uh, we had uh, this big uh, uh, macro phenomenon that have pushed governments to be more interested in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, designing policy on governance in higher education respect to the past. In the past, in every country, we had a few interventions of governments in uh, higher education. In the last three or four decades, depends on the, on the, on the country, we had a continuous attention, or at least a continuous uh, intervention by governments. These uh, reforms, generally speaking, have, motiv have modified not only the organizational characteristics of higher education, in many countries, uh, a vocational higher education track has been created in many countries, especially in continental Europe, uh, university have been uh, given uh, institutional autonomy, but this reform uh, have significantly changed the way uh, in which these systems are coordinated and steered uh, by the introduction of new forms of institutional accountability, evaluation, accreditation, performance funding, and so on. In this uh, uh, broad picture, it's better, I think, uh, to stop for a moment and try to focus on what is the governance problem that governments have to deal with uh, when uh, thinking how to design govern systemic governance in higher education, how uh, to change something and so on. So let's uh, uh, shift from a general macro perspective to a very micro perspective. That is, uh, let's focus uh, on uh, what I define the structural problem of governing universities. Hmm? Because when we talk of uh, uh, governance system, we are talking, uh, you know, a national system usually, but this national system is composed by individual institutions and universities, uh, as uh, those who are specialized in this field uh, uh, know, are sui generis institutions. And this uh, being sui generis institutions explain uh, why a certain point the government decided to intervene in higher education and why it is so difficult uh, to find solutions uh, for the, what uh, are supposed to be public problems in higher education. Why they are sui generis institutions? Because a university, like schools, are considered a typical loose coping organization. Use, using the famous expression of uh, Weick, they are a form of uh, organized anarchy. And this, uh, from uh, uh, exactly because they are uh, loose coping institutions, universities are characterized by the following characteristics. Causal indeterminacy, fragmented internal environment, and fragmented external environment. What uh, does it mean? Uh, causal indeterminacy means that the action of universities are characterized by an intrinsic ambiguity and uncertainty regarding uh, means uh, and relations and uh, by a variety of con contradictory goals. 
if you read the status of the general constitution of your university, of, of many universities, you can discover, for example, that uh, uh, university uh, are, 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 have the aspiration to pursue excellence in research, in, research, in providing freedom to teach, in contributing to the socioeconomic de development, in developing equity, accountability for their society, and so on. But on the, tem on the same time, they are subdivided in a variety of academic disciplines, academic niches. Every discipline has uh, its own uh, mission, epistemological uh, basis, and professional rules. So substantially, to try to understand what are the causes of internal processes is very, very, very complex and very often uh, it is a matter of chance and uh, serendipity. Never forget, uh, just to be clear on this point, uh, that uh, the concept of a garbage can system has been proposed by March and Hosen 40 years ago or 50, 50 years ago after two deep studies uh, on uh, higher education reform in Sweden in, say, 68, and after a deep research on the, on the internal governance of American colleges. After these two research, these three you know, giants of our discipline propose this new model, garbage can model. And the garbage can model is exactly based on causal indeterminacy. So this is something I have always liked uh, of this field, uh, uh, the fact that a so relevant conceptualization uh, comes from an empirical experience inside the university. Then uh, university, exactly because they are loose capital organizations, have a fragmented uh, internal environment. That means uh, that uh, university are composed by uh, different academic tribes, these tribes constantly seek to defend their territories, using a metaphor of Tony Beecher, Academic Tribes and Territories, a beautiful book published in 1988. We know that there are various groups of students with different demands. There is the staff with different demands. So substantially, it's one of the most fragmented organization that you can find with internal groups having very, very different uh, missions, goals, and these missions and goals very often are contradictory. Then the third characteristics of a university like a loose, uh, as loose coping organization is the external, uh, frag the fragmented external environment. That means simply that university live in a contest in an environment uh, uh, where, uh, from where they receive continuously very different contradictory types of demands. They are uh, asked uh, to help uh, the local economic de de development. They are, uh, they are asked to do something uh, uh, respect to the uh, technological application. They are asked uh, to improve uh, the quality of uh, uh, of the stock of human capital. They are asked to contribute to the socialization and selection of, uh, of uh, social elite. And they, have asked also, they are asked also to contribute to social mobility. So all in all, as you, we can see, uh, there are interesting uh, characteristics of these institutions. Uh, Gilberto, and, uh, sorry? Just a minute. Uh, you, you mentioned something about the garbage can Model? Okay. What, 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 what is this? I have never heard uh, uh, about this model before. Uh, it's a decisional model proposed in a, in a paper, I think, published uh, in 1972, uh, quoted by Cohen, March, and Holsen, uh, that proposed what we could define a kind of uh, uh, apparently irrational. Uh, uh, decision-making model in which there is no line, linearity, in which actors do not have clear preferences, in which there are not clear decisional uh, uh, 
uh, rules in which preferences are completely uh, endogenous in the sense that actors uh, uh, shape their preferences uh, um, through the interaction with the other actors in which the final result is not determined. Uh, these are, uh, this, uh, this is a type of decision-making model in which uh, it could happen very often that there is no final decision and in which it could, uh, usually the final criterion for deciding is not a specific uh, uh, rational uh, criterion, but very often is chance. It happens that at a certain point uh, we can find an agreement. So it's uh, one of the most... Uh, uh, known uh, uh, decision-making models uh, in public policy, but also in organization theory. Okay. Okay. <laughs> then so, I was... Uh, so, you, so, you, so you say that universities are... are... Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I uh, incidentally uh, muted Jacob. Let, him, let me... No, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, Jacob, universities are like this. I'm simply saying that uh, um, this uh, uh, model of decision-making has been proposed after uh, an, a couple of empirical research uh, in, uh, in uh, university institutions. And personally, I have to say uh, that uh, this uh, very often uh, happen, uh, happens in a university, uh, not, I'm saying this not only because I have studied in this field for many years, but also because I had an institutional uh, uh, position in my university. I've been dean and so on, and I have, uh, I would say, uh, experienced that very often uh, there is this process of garbage can uh, inside uh, the decision-making of the university. However, okay. What I'm trying to say is that uh, loose coupling, the loose coupling characteristics of uh, universities complicates the institutional coordination that is their uh, internal governance. And this uh, also however, explain why universities are capable to adapt and survive. The fact that they are loose capping uh, organizations means that their internal governance is very complicated. Intrinsically, they cannot behave like corporate organization, but exactly this uh, uh, dimension, if uh, from uh, on the one hand, do, does not allow usually to take strategic decisions, on the other hand, allow university uh, to adapt and survive. Hmm? Never forget the, that university the, is the most, uh, the, I would say, the oldest institution, at least in the Western world, after the church. Uh, and this is uh, something on which we should uh, think. So exactly this point has been, uh, hmm, I would say the target of the, all this reform. At a certain point, governments decided that universities uh, needed, uh, needed to, I would say, be more accountable, uh, needed to do something more for the socioeconomic uh, needs of the society. And then uh, all these reforms have tried substantially to change systemic governance, to push universities uh, to behave as corporate orga organizations. So the main, I would say, target of all this reform has been, if you allow me, uh, that one to tighten the loose, tight a bit the loose couple characteristics of universities. Hope this is clear. Any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Great. This is a, oh, I don't see this. Uh, this is a, the Barton Clark Triangle, and this this is substantially uh, a proposal to uh, understand uh, how uh, systemic governance of a university system worked. Uh, I would say in the past. Uh, this is a quite famous. Uh, uh, theoretical proposition proposed by Barton Clark, uh, who uh, substantially uh, proposed that uh, 
systemic coordination in higher education system could be based on three general principles, state authority, market, and academic oligarchy. The idea was, okay, we could have a, a hierarchy in the sense that the state authority could prevail uh, in steering a higher education system, like substantially uh, could be uh, France until uh, before the reforms. Then we have market, that means uh, a situation in which uh, systemic coordination is guaranteed by competition between uh, university institutions. And then you have the role of academic oligarchy. That means uh, substantially that uh, the strongest uh, disciplinary, academic disciplinary groups uh, could be those coordinating the system. There is something on which I want to be clear here, is that this three principle of uh, uh, systemic coordination that we could translate, I don't know, in a more modern language in a hierarchy, market and network, for example, uh, have been uh, quite uh, discussed in higher education literature. Why? Because all in all, all the countries uh, look to be uh, look to belong to a mix of these criteria. To be clear, let's talk uh, uh, about uh, the systemic governance in continental Europe uh, before the reforms. Uh, it was an interesting situation. Why? Because institutions, that means universities as institutions, didn't have institutional autonomy at all, and the system was coordinated through a, a strict interaction between uh, the central ministry and uh, the most important uh, uh, academic, dis uh, academic uh, disciplinary groups inside the university. So substantially you had a mix of a two uh, general principles of uh, coordination. What is relevant, however, is exactly that uh, according to uh, this uh, original uh, conceptualization of principle of general coordination at the systemic level, uh, only Anglo-Saxon institutions were considered capable to be autonomous. This is something that should be clear. Uh, actually, we think that uh, institutional autonomy is something that belongs to all the institutions, the university institution. But before the reforms, uh, institu university institutions were autonomous uh, only in those systems in which uh, there was, in a way or another, uh, some uh, market mechanism guaranteeing competition. And this, is, was, this was not the case in continental Europe, in many Asian countries, in many Latin American countries. Then we had, as I told, the fact that uh, I would say it depends on, uh, on, on, uh, on the countries, but we can say between 50s and 70s uh, of the past uh, century or millennium, uh, so see, societies and governments started to take great interest in higher education because uh, substantially they perceived to be in a, a global context of strong competition. And so they wanted, uh, they wanted more from university. They started to ask uh, uh, a major contribution uh, to the uh, to increase the quality of uh, human capital, uh, human capital uh, to uh, I would say be more uh, uh, interested in doing something to support the socio-economic uh, development of countries. So, at a certain point, after decades, uh, I would say of. Uh, of lack of interest of, uh, of governments with respect to university. Uh, I don't know if you know the expression ivory tower, that is a, a metaphor that very often it, it has been used uh, to define university. We, like, we could say that this metaphor could uh, be 
uh, could represent the relationship between university and their own society for at least one century. But again, between 50 and 60s, uh, governments starting to ask more to universities. They started uh, to ask for a rapid increase of uh, participation rates. And this is uh, the process through which uh, we shifted uh, from an elite, uh, elitistic system to a massified system. They started to ask for a diversification of uh, educational demands. So we, the government started to ask university every kind of education, not only general education, but uh, not only specialized education, but uh, also lifelong uh, learning, distance, distance learning courses, uh, internationalization of courses, so research training, and uh, so on. They asked the university to go for greater knowledge generation, and they asked the uh, uh, university to develop training and technology for local community and, and, and so on. Uh, this, it has been, uh, I would say, sorry, it has, it has been really a long but deep uh, process through which the relationship between society and governments and their own higher education system uh, is really changed. Uh, we, 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 can, we can think to uh, that this kind uh, of change in the, in the state uh, university uh, relationship is uh, something uh, that we could really define a radical change. Uh, what have been, uh, which kind of ideas uh, have, uh, have developed governments uh, uh, to, uh, to reform, to try to redesign systemic governance in a way that university could be pushed uh, towards uh, what uh, uh, were considered the most uh, relevant socioeconomic uh, needs. Uh, so let's talk about the kind of ideas they have used uh, for many, just to introduce uh, uh, the concept of policy ideas. It's very, very, very rough. There are uh, colleagues here that could talk uh, uh, weeks about what is a policy idea. Uh, I have chosen a couple of definitions. A policy idea is a programmatic set of statements uh, of cause and effect concerning a specific policy problem together with a policy theory or method for influencing this cause of relationship, America and Kersbergen. Uh, Peter Hall suggests uh, that uh, ideas and standards uh, are not only the goals of policy and the kind of instruments that can be used to attain them, but also the very nature of the problems they are meant to address in. So what have been the ideas uh, that government uh, have focused on and on which uh, they have developed these reforms? Uh, there is a long list. First of all, institutional autonomy. I want to underline again that outside the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, until 30, 40 years ago, universities were not autonomous. Academic guilds were uh, really autonomous. Uh, the central minister, uh, ministry was uh, as a, had a strong power, but institutions uh, uh, were not autonomous. Uh, universities had no autonomous power. Usually, uh, most uh, of the decisions were taken at the center of the, uh, of the system uh, through a kind of negotiation with uh, the local groups of, uh, of, uh, of academics. So the pivotal idea uh, outside the Anglo-Saxon world was let's give uh, universities uh, institutional autonomy. Then uh, the other side of this, uh, of this uh, uh, idea is institutional accountability. Uh, so we said, if we give them autonomy, finally, we should find a way to make them accountable, hmm? which is uh, uh, not simple. Why? Because as we will see, there are different ways to which uh, university autonomous university institution can be uh, can be made accountable. Then another big uh, 
uh, idea of this reform has been competition based on the rough uh, conceptualization that, you know, if you have autonomous institutions, uh, if and our policy are well designed, then they will behave like corporate organization and then they could compete to have more sources, uh, the best professor and so. Another idea was evaluation. Hmm? So uh, that means evaluation of research, but also in, uh, in some countries, uh, systemic evaluation of teaching. There has been this new idea that uh, had never appeared before uh, three decades ago of performance funding, the idea to give uh, a certain percentage of public funding to university, to universities uh, based on uh, uh, their performance, uh, either on teaching or in research. And then uh, there has been uh, another idea has been privatization. Privatization is an idea that uh, has not been uh, really implemented uh, in the Western world uh, in this sense, but uh, privatization has been uh, an idea that uh, has characterized, for example, the uh, governance uh, reform in Latin America, where uh, many, many governments have uh, decided uh, to allow uh, the development of a big private sector in higher education. And then the final idea uh, uh, was uh, the idea of staying at the distance. The idea was, okay, it's time to shift from the state control model where the state was pivotal in steering the system uh, to the so-called state supervising model. If the idea was substantially, the student at the distance uh, is, a, is a, a label through which all the other ideas are uh, uh, put together. The idea of the student at the distance is that substantially, if uh, our, uh, we have given autonomy to university, if we have a bit of competition, if we have evaluation and so on, then the state uh, could simply, could simply, could simply, I would say, stay at the distance and uh, uh, drive the system uh, using uh, uh, specific uh, instruments of performance funding, uh, specific instruments of, uh, of evaluation and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So a few example of, uh, a few illustration of uh, the application of these ideas. Uh, in European countries, uh, and when I say European, I mean uh, uh, substantially continental European, also Nordic European, I would say Europe uh, uh, without, uh, without UK substantially, a bit Ireland. Governments have, uh, in the last decades, have abandoned the state control model in, in favor of stealing university from a distance. Uh, in some countries, uh, uh, both in Europe and the, in Asia, uh, the government has also the gov governments have uh, also radically changed the institutional arrangement of universities by abandon abandoning the traditional democratic procedure for elected institutional leaders. One of the ways through which uh, uh, governments have tried to make uh, more stronger the capacity of a university to be autonomous and then to behave like a corporate organization has been to change by law uh, the internal institutional governance. So in all these countries, I have cited, the, but also in others, uh, the governments has changed the law uh, to make possible for university to have uh, rectors at and presidents appointed and not elected, deans and uh, director of department appointed and not elected. In the English speaking world, the governments have increased their intervention and regulation of, despite a tradition of institutional autonomy. Here we have a kind of historical divide in the sense that historically in, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon countries, a university uh, existed as institution and they were uh, for different historical reasons uh, and they were uh, uh, autonomous uh, to make them uh, more, uh, I would say, more capable uh, to, to pursue 
the social, uh, e economic and political goals of governments uh, in these uh, uh, countries, especially in UK, Australia and New Zealand, uh, uh, governments have increased their intervention and regulation. Uh, for example, in uh, UK, Australia and New Zealand, government have created national agency for the assessment of research and teaching uh, and so on. At the same time, uh, uh, public university in US have been strongly encouraged to adopt a more competitive stance to obtain more funding from private sources in a substantial process of marketization. In Asia and in Latin America, there have been more complex dynamics uh, due to different economic tradition, political context and financial situations. Uh, it is important to underline that in this last three decades in, East, in India, in East Asia, and also in many Latin American countries, uh, we can find a high number of private institutions. What happened in these countries? Uh, under the pressure of massification uh, in these countries, in this continent, governments to maintain what the perceived quality of public systems preferred to, in, uh, uh, to design incentives uh, for the establishment of public, uh, public uh, sorry, of private institutions. So there are countries in which the numbers of, uh, of private institutions are really, really high. But again, this has been a conscious right or wrong decision based on the idea that government wanted to maintain, to keep, uh, to keep uh, what they perceived to be the high quality of their elitistic public, uh, public system. Uh, if you go to Brazil, for example, Brazil is an excellent case in which a leftist uh, policy uh, 20 years ago has contributed to uh, push an incredible, uh, uh, an incredible uh, uh, increasing of the number of private institutions, uh, those uh, that, are private, that are institutions in which substantially uh, you pay low fees because they are mass uh, institutions. And it has been exactly because the perception of the left leftist Brazilian government was exactly that. Uh, uh, they wanted uh, to maintain what was perceived a very elitistic, selective, high quality public system. So in every country, the new ideas have been applied in a way or in another. So we can find uh, uh, evaluation, institutional accountability, competition uh, applied in every country. Uh, but uh, obviously uh, we cannot uh, uh, speak of convergence uh, uh, toward a similar mode of systemic governance of higher education uh, simply because uh, there has been uh, a, common, uh, a common usage of the same idea. We can make the mistake, for example, to think that NPM has, apply, has been applied everywhere or that every way neoliberal policy in higher education has been uh, introduced uh, if uh, we can do this only if we don't focus on the way to which uh, this general or generic ideas have been applied in designing reform. Uh, my main thesis is that substantially everywhere uh, uh, some forms of evaluation have been uh, introduced, uh, as well as some form of competition, but the fact that in every country you could find a bit of competition, a bit of evaluation, and so on, does not mean that there is a, a kind of uh, a neoliberal convergence in this policy. And we can grasp this by focusing on the policy and instruments adopted uh, to design this, uh, uh, these yes. reforms. Gilberto, may I ask uh, sure. one uh, question now? Uh, probably you are going to answer it uh, later, but I give you the opportunity to, to uh, drink and to have some air. 
So the question is, um, okay, there was no convergence, but um, can we say that the system now is uh, better uh, in terms of uh, academic achievements of the students, uh, the lifestyle of the, 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 the welfare of the faculty, the, per, the accountability of the system because of those reforms? To what extent they were uh, successful? Okay, you have anticipated something on which I want, I did not want to uh, uh, talk, let's say in this way, <laughs> you know, because, uh, it, you know, you are putting many questions. Hmm? And okay. so it's quite clear that uh, we do not have this kind uh, of uh, uh, general analysis of, uh, let's call it policy performance of these governance changes. This is the real point. In the sense, this is one of the problem, I think, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we have in public policy. We are so interested in, uh, in, uh, explain, in explaining processes, uh, uh, in explaining outputs, uh, but with the justification that there is not necessarily a direct uh, uh, causal path between uh, policy output and policy outcome, uh, we very often try to avoid uh, to treat of policy outcomes. So I can reply to your question saying that uh, according to a research I have done with colleagues uh, comparing uh, uh, systemic performance in teaching in uh, 12 uh, European countries uh, uh, where you had uh, proper forms of teaching and research evaluation, we, you can find an improvement of uh, uh, of the, I would say, uh, of the number of citizens uh, of a specific uh, age cohort uh, with a university degree. You know, this is something on which I'm, uh, I have a high level of certainty. Then on the other dimension, there is not enough research. You know what I mean? And this depends on, uh, on the countries. For example, uh, regarding... Uh, regarding the, 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 the question of the situation of the academic staff, we perfectly know that uh, the number of uh, academics without the tenure uh, is really increased in many countries. You know what I mean? This is a, 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 clear, a clear product of certain forms of... of, of uh, of competition, or for example, if you uh, have a look to the uh, use of uh, uh, research evaluation in those countries in which research evaluation uh, uh, of the system really matter uh, in terms of percentage of uh, public funding given to university, and around the world there are two countries uh, in which uh, national research assessment uh, really matters in terms of a percentage of public funding, and these countries are, are uh, UK and Italy substantially, you can see that usually uh, the, same, uh, the same university win uh, uh, a relevant percentage uh, of the public funding. So frankly speaking, uh, in terms of, of effects, uh, there is not enough research. But there is, I would say, a relevant uh, uh, empirical evidence uh, is that uh, countries uh, intervene, government intervenes very often in changing uh, governance rules in their uh, university uh, system, very often in a contradictory way. Uh, we have done an interesting research on uh, comparing the trajectories of reforms in 16 European countries, and we have discovered that, uh, I, would, uh, I would say, that it's not clear, uh, but this is a, a point of fact, uh, that there is a continuous uh, uh, reversal over time of the decision respect to governance in higher education. I don't know if I have replied to your question. Yes, you did. Okay. Uh, I have more questions, but I'll let you go. Okay, on. but uh, if uh, I'm, I think that I'm not uh, 
taking all your, I'm mean, taking too much, too much no, time. No, you are doing excellent. You are doing excellent. Go. Uh, okay. Uh, what we can say uh, about these reforms over time, uh, there are different interpretation. In the sense, if you check, if you have a look to the literature, there are those seen. Uh, there is uh, all the countries are going for steering at the distance. There are other scholars saying, "Ha, there has been a prevalence of neoliberal reforms." And there are other scholars say, "No, no, no, no steering at the distance, no neoliberal reform. Uh, there is a process of re-regulation of governance in uh, in uh, in a comparative higher education." Uh, But what emerges is that the pure types of governance arrangement do not actually exist. The main principle of coordination, a hierarchy, market, and network have been combined in various ways and do also the related policy ideas. And substantially, uh, all governance arrangements uh, uh, have become a kind of ideational hybrids uh, and are characterized as working through policy mixes. And uh, we have, uh, with other colleagues in the last year, assessed uh, uh, this mix system, adopting a quite famous typology of, uh, of uh, instruments, uh, regulation, expenditure, and taxation. Uh, this is the system we have codified substantially. We have, uh, I would say, conceptualized and uh, classified all the types uh, of uh, instruments adopted to design governance reform in higher education uh, according four general families of uh, instruments. Uh, we have also uh, divided these instruments in those instru instruments uh, uh, that uh, represent opportunities that favor behavior for university and the instruments that favor, or better, that represent constraint in university. I don't want uh, uh, to bore you on this. Uh, what emerges uh, from, uh, from this analysis? That uh, all the countries have tried to go for a still you know, the distance uh, uh, mode of governing their higher education system, but, but that uh, this, uh, uh, steering from a distance mode is not a unique mode, but uh, it has been, uh, I would say, interpreted according to the national tradition in at least three different uh, modes that in a way or another can be considered hybrids uh, of the steering at the distance uh, mode. That means uh, some ideas of this general mode, but uh, I would say, with other ideas and instruments. So we have distinguished uh, uh, a performance-oriented mode, that is a, a systemic governance uh, system in higher education when there is a, a significant percentage of public funding based on the result of research, many regulations and administrative procedures, uh, student support based on loans, and relatively high tuition fees. We have distinguished a re-regulated mode where uh, there are many procedural constraints uh, on the main activities, recruitment, promotion, postdoc, teaching content, and student admission. There is a pro proceduralization of the quality assurance. There is a certain use of target funding and performance funding. There is an average low public funding and low tuition fees. And then we have distinguished a goal-oriented mode of steering systemic governance. That is a mode in which clear systemic goals are stated by governments. Uh, there is a high public funding. There is a strategic use of uh, performance funding. And the student support is mostly based on, on grants. And there is no or low tuition fees. Before you go, can you give us uh, some indication which countries uh, stay? I'm coming. Uh, yeah. I think the perform. Okay, go on. Okay. To give you some example, according to our, I would say, empirical uh, classification, in Europe it appears that only England and partially Italy fits this hybrid, while in America and in Asia, performance is a, a pillar criterion for governing higher education systems. So 
We have a few examples in Europe. We have many examples of performance-oriented mode in Americas. That means substantially, I would say, uh, Latin American except Brazil. And in Oceania, uh, there is New Zealand that has been the pioneer of shifting towards a performance-oriented, uh, this performance-oriented hybrid. What is interesting is that if we focus only in the small Europe, uh, we all very often discuss that how our system are uh, performance-oriented and so on. But if we enlarge the perspective, this is not the case. And we have really few cases in Europe compared to other continents. The re-regulatory mode, it's, uh, it can be considered a recurrent trend in European countries. Uh, many, and also in many Asian, in some, sorry, you know, it's worrying, uh, in some Asian countries like uh, China, Japan, and Malaysia. And frankly speaking, I do not have uh, uh, enough uh, information because there are not enough empirical work to better understand if this framework could be applied to Latin American countries uh, or in some states of, of US or provinces of Canada. For example, at my knowledge, Quebec in the last years uh, has clearly adopted a re-regulative mode. As you know, in federal countries and especially in US and in Canada, higher education governance is completely in the power of the state provincial government. The goal-oriented mode is a strange hybrid because according to our data and our information, it is present substantially in Nordic European countries. Uh, probably this is not the case that the four Nordic European countries are the motherland of the broad, uh, the most important, uh, most dense uh, forms of welfare state. But this hybrid is also prevalent in cities like Singapore and Hong Kong before, I would say, uh, the, the, the la what starting, started to happen in the last uh, two years. For your uh, uh, interest, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, how uh, instruments uh, constraining institutional behavior and instruments offering uh, uh, opportunities uh, to university institutional behavior have developed uh, in 25 years uh, in 16 European countries. And what is obviously is a, a, the, these are aggregated data, but uh, the aggregated data in these 16 years, uh, it's very, very interesting because we have clearly had a development of uh, constraints and a decrease of uh, instruments adopted offering opportunities uh, to, to, uh, to university institutions. This substantially means that in Europe, the re-regulatory -regulator uh, mode, uh, I would say, started to develop in most of the countries. No, sorry, I have some point of conclusion. Governance in higher education undergoes ongoing process of changes. Of, very often, there are not partisan preferences. What we have uh, discovered by something that we have not still published yet, always in these uh, 16 European countries, is, is that we have tried to find any kind of correlation, relationship between the change uh, of government, the change of coalitions, uh, to understand if uh, in this uh, long lasting process of changing governance in higher education, there are, uh, there is a relevant role of partisan preferences and we didn't find any minimal proof of this. So this is uh, uh, interesting because it's clear that uh, uh, there are uh, usually in every country there are more relevant political issues, but to find no, no, no relevant or small, sorry, relationship between partisan preferences and uh, uh, governance reforms made in the last 25, 30 years in higher education is very, very interesting. It looks that change in governments uh, is driven by contextual and contingent logics. So, so we made the hypothesis that uh, 
there is a kind of effect of loose coupling characteristic of universities. And so the fact that every time there is a new policy intervention, the nature, the intrinsic organizational nature of university is capable to be resilient against this policy intervention. We have seen that hybridity is prevailing and we have seen that substantially this hybridity allows the uh, a big variety of uh, assessment by observers about the characteristics of the actual governance moves. So the real point is that exactly because this uh, structural hybrid hybridity of the systemic governance in higher education, uh, the ideational map, the cognitive maps of the observers makes the difference in terms of assessment of interpretation of what's going on, which is a bit a mess from a scholarly point of view. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Gilberto. And uh, we'll take um, now questions that comes first from the text, uh, starting with uh, Moshe Maor, and then going to Claudio. And then uh, if others want to, to come in, please come in. So starting with Moshe, and we, we, we will take um, a few questions or comments at this before you, you answer because of the limitation of the time. So Moshe first and then Claudio and then... Thank you, we'll thank see. you. Thank you Gilberto for a very stimulating uh, uh, presentation. My question is, uh, theoretical one. I wonder to what extent concept from historical institutionalism, like a gradual change that may lead to radical change, for example, layering, conversion, drift, displacement, and exhaustion, could provide some more theoretical underpinning for the process of systemic higher education reform. I can give you an example. You have the six dimensions. One of them is a a reform of institutional autonomy of higher education. Now you can examine comparatively whether the reform of institutional autonomy of higher education was implemented by layer layering, conversion, and so on. Yes, uh, may, may I reply immediately? Uh, so, uh, okay. It's quite clear if you go for a small number of cases analysis, you can do this, you know what I mean? So I have done something, uh, some empirical research on uh, Italian uh, reforms, uh, Dutch reforms, and then I can uh, apply and it works. But if you try to increase the number of cases, uh, it, first it becomes problematic. We did uh, with the data we had, uh, and uh, we, we have used, for example, uh, the, 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 the types of welfare system and of higher education, previous higher education system, you know, as a uh, uh, variables that could explain this uh, path dependence, it didn't work. So the real point is that if you go for a small number of cases analysis, so, so you do a, you reconstruct uh, the evolution of higher education governance in Italy, uh, in the Netherlands, in UK, you can apply these concepts and they could explain something. But if you try to do a more, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a result, a comparative research increasing the number of cases, especially if you are interested uh, uh, to, to, to go towards more than 20, it's more problematic to, 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 to apply this concept. Thank you. And Claudio, please. Uh, thank you, Giliberto. I very much like the cross country variation and then uh, the effort you made. Uh, to describe uh, some of the groups uh, of the countries um, that come together once you've done your original analysis. And this is something that uh, I have found myself in, uh, in another project where I, I did my research and then the countries uh, were falling in baskets that uh, were not really <laughs> the ones I expected. Uh, so the question is what is, uh, the theoretical approach construct uh, that uh, makes sense of the cross-country variation. One would not imagine Italy and the UK, for example, in the same set, but the findings that are accurate, granular, precise, tell us that. I wonder whether your 
uh, findings in terms of variation are compatible more with something like uh, state traditions, varieties of capitalism, uh, um, families of political economies uh, or uh, institutional theories, or perhaps it's, uh, it's Gilberto's theory. I mean, that, that is no, no. economy of policy. And there is a theory that says that uh, Italy and the UK go together. I, you know, I like the fact that they do not conform to the classic expectations, which means that uh, we should not use all the times the classic expectations. And I say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah it's okay, the, the, you know, liberal coordinated economies, blah, blah, blah. But something original. So I praise the originality, but I think it would be nice to have uh, also an intuition or a theory that explains the variation mm -hmm. across okay, the thanks. groups. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the question, uh, Claudio. It's clear that, uh, uh, okay, in, uh, in the research we did on 16 countries, there are two strange countries, partially outlier countries that are Italy, that is partially, I have simplified in the presentation, that partially belongs to the performance-based mode and partially belongs to the re-regulated mode. It's okay. And... Uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, is another partial outlier because partially belongs, uh, I would say, on some dimension, on some instruments, it belongs to the Nordic countries. Uh, on other instruments, it belongs to the re-regulated countries. It's okay. So the real problem here is uh, uh, that when you go for a gra as we have, you have the call it a granular analysis, when you go to, to check the instrument, it's quite clear that you can find uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, I would say, partial outlier. And so it's quite clear that, uh, but this was a part of a research we have not finished. At that point, you should go for a more uh, uh, case-based analysis to understand something. This is uh, my point, because using, uh, uh, we try to use, the, as I told you, uh, different, uh, I would say, uh, uh, different uh, theories, uh, uh, to do this comparison between 16, among 16 countries and nothing works. So I have no theory, you know, I have a problem. <laughs> I have an empirical problem. So I'm not saying that there is you know, a certain point I thought, uh, okay, we, this can, or we made, made a mistake, I don't know, in, uh, in coding the, the data, and this could be the case, but we have tried and retried. Or... At a certain point, I thought, come on, it's, it's simply by chance, you know what I mean? Huh? And then we are still thinking about that. The real problem is that uh, uh, if we go and we are doing on, uh, on, 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 in that case analysis, we miss uh, this uh, medium high number of cases dimension, you know what I mean? So I'm still thinking about that. However, I am not a personal theory. I have, I would say, a uh, a theoretical problem coming from uh, from uh, from uh, this. Uh, put, put in another way, how is possible or why a certain point uh, Italy is the only country uh, country uh, uh, together with uh, UK that have decided to invest so to give so much uh, of the public funding to university uh, by this uh, by this tool. You know, this is a serious question. You you know, it's. Uh, so in other cases, uh, we, you know, uh, this didn't happen. Uh, we know that there are dozens of countries around the world uh, in, that give money uh, to university according to something like the national research exercise, but it's a small percentage of money, you know what I mean? So uh, I don't have a, a response to you. And so if you can help me, I'm here, you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, now for Romulo, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gilberto. This is Romulo from Agder in, in Norway. Hi. Uh, a short comment, because I know there's a lot of people waiting in the question. Uh, you, you mentioned Burton Clark. And one of the things that Burton Clark says is that all, all the higher education systems have an inherent tension between order and disorder. And of course, attempts at fostering one tend to create unintended effects on the other. Right. I mean, here, here in Norway, uh, you know, governance attempts in you know, the intellectual bibliometric has substantially increased uh, research productivity, but has enhanced the, the, the tensions that exist between research groups, between top universities, as you also mentioned in the UK, the haves and the have-nots. And, it's, you know, it has affected the traditional egalitarian 
orientation um, you know, of, of, of Nordic academia. Um, and, and related to that, one of the things you mentioned was autonomy. And, and I wonder whether we could zoom in a little bit more because there's at least two different types of autonomy. There is the procedural and there's a substantive, right? So the what of high education and the how of high education. And my understanding, at least in the Nordic context, is that most of the reforms in the last 15 to 20 years, many of them NPM and post-NPM inspired, have primarily uh, restricted the, the substantive autonomy of, of universities, right, through the contractual arrangements, performance indicators, and that output elements, while at the same time enhancing or fostering uh, procedural autonomy, right? Uh, assuming that now we have these strong managers in place, they know what to do with this autonomy. And then the question is, what do you think this will do in terms of the, the, the classic balance between order and disorder that, you know, to go back to my earlier comment that Clark is talking about, particularly in the context of adaptability and resilience that you touched upon, which I'm very interested. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks, uh, for, uh, Romulo, for this question. Yes, I completely agree. Uh, in most uh, uh, countries around the world, the government have given more uh, procedural autonomy than substantial autonomy, but it is rational from their point of view because uh, their main goal is to push university to pursue some societal uh, goals, and so your know, goals are established by the governments, and then I give you procedural autonomy. Oh, there are other countries, the more re-regulated, in which uh, also procedural uh, autonomy has uh, decreased a bit. I think that the consequence uh, uh, of this in terms of uh, order and disorder is that at a certain point, uh, uh, the capacity or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the resilience capacity of university, put in another way, the different institutional logics working inside the university uh, are capable, I would say, to manage also this uh, uh, lack of autonomy, of substantial autonomy, you know what I mean? Because uh, in a way or another, exactly because there are some uh, relevant general goals established by the government, uh, usually what happens is that those, uh, uh, let's say it in another way, those academic, those academic groups inside uh, a specific institution uh, that are more uh, uh, near, more close to this goal, we work on that, while the other groups can continue to work on their things, you know what I mean? So, in a way or another, uh, this, uh, let's call it, uh, I, I don't like the word, but let's call it uh, really resilience, it's helping universities uh, to maintain uh, a certain, uh, I would say, internal uh, uh, institutional logic differentiation exactly because they are loose couple system, you know what I mean? So exactly because they are very, very uh, differentiated uh, uh, internally, uh, when the government propose a, a goal, uh, you are sure that there will be some groups of your, your, of your academics that will be capable to pursue that goal, you know what I mean? And then the others could uh, uh, could go ahead doing uh, their things. So I think that in a way or another, there will be not more disorder, although it's quite clear that uh, what is going on uh, in many countries now is that, uh, exactly because the new goals of government are funded more than the other goals, uh, there could be some internal conflicts, you know what I mean? It's typical be between uh, the groups of those uh, uh, academics working more on applied research and those working more on humanities, for example. You can have this, uh, uh, this conflict, but very often universities find, find the balance. Uh, very often it could happen, there are experiences in many countries in which if uh, uh, certain disciplines get more money from the government because they are doing applied research, then there will be an internal distribution, not pairing completely, but giving some uh, uh, balance some uh, incentive to those who, uh, who are not doing applied research. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Gilberto. I know that there are more questions. And if you, if you agree, I will do something that um, I'm in innovating. I will make you co-host. I make you the host. And if you can stay a few more minutes with the others, uh, please do. And I will leave for my teaching uh, duties. 
Um, so I, I'll make you an host and you can uh, limit the time that you are um, open for discussion, but I don't want to stop the discussion. I just want to, to do my stuff. So thank you very much, Gilberto. Thank you very much all. Uh, pleasure to have you and to get to know you uh, better. Hi. Um, see you um, later. Bye-bye.